Welcome to lecture number 17 for ECE 461 control systems, modeling a DC servo motor. Now the problem we're looking at in this lecture is come up with a dynamic model for a specific DC motor. This is a Clifton 53479-002 servo motor. And like we did in our last lecture, the model for servo motor in general is in this form. If we want to control angle, it's one over S times the second order system. If we want to control speed, then get rid of that one over S, derivative of angle is speed, and you have a second order system. Now, part of the motivation for this, this is what the little DC motor looks like. It's a servo motor. All a servo motor means is that if you apply voltage, it spins and can go forward or backwards. So that's, that's the servo, it goes either way. A DC motor, meaning two leads, you've got the plus and minus going to it. And if you notice on these motors, oftentimes they don't have the dynamics printed on the side, which is going to be a problem for us. I'd like to design a feedback controller to control the position and angle of the motor, but to do that, I need to know the dy dynamics. So how do I model this if the dynamics aren't printed on the side? That's the objective of today's lecture, finding d the dynamics for motor. So one option. If you can go to the web and search for your motor, there's a chance you'll find it. Uh, this one actually found a uh, posting that had a clipping from servo systems from 2002, roughly, uh, that, that describes the motor. So here I kind of got lucky. It's got the torque constant. That's the back EMF, 11.65 volts per kilo RPM. That's the same thing as the torque constant in ounces per amp. If you convert everything to metric, it's the same number. Uh, let's see what else do you have. That's really about all it tells you. I don't know the resistance. I don't know the inductance. I don't know the inertia. I don't know the time constant. But otherwise, well, I actually don't know a whole lot. But that's what you get from the data sheets. If you're lucky, you can find them. Another way to do it is kind of today's lecture. Let's do a couple measurements. And you really don't have to know all that much to find the dynamics per motor. There's only five parameters that define it. There's the armature resistance, the armature inductance, the torque constant, that's in volts per rating per second, or it's also newton meters per amp. Those are the same. You've got the motor inertia and the motor friction. So if I can do five tests, I can figure out what the motor dynamics are. Now to start out with the armature, this is what the armature looks like, or hitting the right button. This is the armature for a typical DC motor. And if you notice, it's actually just a coil. It's an inductor. I've got a bunch of wires wrapped around an iron core. And what's happening is that produces an electromagnet. This is called the commutator right here. It's got all these different bands on it. Uh, when I connect power and ground across one side, I excite or power up one of these electromagnets. As it rotates, one switches out and the next one turns on. So what I'm doing is I'm constantly switching in, switching out electromagnets. What that does is that provides a little bit of a torque. By switching in and out, I don't get the zero crossings on the, but, uh, for a single phase, single winding motor with the rectified sine wave. This keeps the torque more constant. I'm always operating near the peak of the sine wave for the torque. There's also some twisting here. That twisting helps keep the voltage more uniform. So that's what the armature looks like. Uh, to model it, it's an inductor. An inductor has inductance and resistance. And it's just a, not just a single inductor. This one actually has, if I count it, one, two, three, four, five. This one actually has six different inductors, six electromagnets on the same motor. That's part of the reason DC motors are such heavier, more expensive than AC motors. I've actually got six motors in one. Only one of the inductors is powered up at any given time, but it actually has six inside of it. So, if I want to measure the inductance, what I can do is just take the motor and turn off the motor. If the motor spins, I get back EMF. That's going to mess up the measurement. Disconnect the motor from the circuit, because if the circuit's in there, if the circuit has some resistance, it's going to mess up the measurements. Just take the motor by its lonesome. Measure the resistance across the terminals. And what you'll notice is the resistance keeps on changing as I turn it, because as I turn it, I'm switching in and out different coils on the inductor. 
So just kind of take the average reading or do a couple readings, find one that's typical. This one, I'll call 26.5 ohms. It varies quite a bit, depending upon which coil you're actually exciting. Uh, sometimes you can actually excite two at the same time when you're going between the, the brushes. But again, that's measure the, re the resistance to the armature. If you splurge and have an inductance meter, you can measure the inductance as well. Uh, for example, this is an Agilent inductance meter that I borrowed from our technician, Jeff. Uh, this tells me that the motor has an inductance of 12.698 millihenries. And what we'll actually see is the inductance is actually usually small. You oftentimes ignore the inductance because relative to the mechanical time constant, the electrical time constant is very, very fast. And we'll see that in just a little bit later. So anyways, that's two parameters. I've got the resistance and inductance of the armature. Uh, next, I'd like to measure the torque constant. The torque constant is Newton meters per amp. So what I could do is take the motor. My motor's, my desk isn't flat. Take the motor, apply constant current to the motor, and measure the torque. And the torque is related to the current by Newton meters per amp. It's related to the to KT. So KT is Newton meters per amp. Another way to measure it is spin the motor at a constant speed and measure the voltage. That'll give you volts per rating per second. In the data sheets, that's actually given. Well, at least the one I found on the 2002. It says your back EMF is 11.65 volts per kilo RPM. And the joys of English units, got to convert that to metric. So 11.65 volts per kilo RPM, bring the minutes to the numerator, it's volts minutes per kilo revolution. Uh, one kilo revolution is a thousand revolutions. 60 seconds is one minute, that cancels the minutes. And one revolution is two pi radians. Put that all together and I get 0.111 volts per rating per second or volts seconds per radian. So that's the torque constant based upon what I found on the web. If you aren't that lucky, you can actually measure it. So one way to measure it is I'll do a test. I'll take the motor, kind of like this. So the test is like this. I'm applying five volts to the motor. The five volts makes the motor spin, which you can see right here. If I measure the current and measure the speed of the motor, I can tell you the torque constant. The way I measure current is, I didn't do it here, but break the power line in series and put an ammeter right in the middle and measure the current on that line. To measure the speed, that's what this board does. This is a PIC processor from Veta Systems. This guy right here is an optical encoder. It produces 250 pulses per second. So if I can measure pulses per second, I can tell you speed. Uh, so this little pick will measure speed and output the data to the PC on the serial port. With that, I can then know what the speed is. So right now it's spinning at 32 radians per second. Uh, the resistance we found was 26.5 ohms. That's from before. The current that I measured was 74 milliamps. I applied five volts to it. And I just have one unknown, KT. Or in terms of the circuit, again, I'm applying five volts. I know I times R. Inductance doesn't matter because this is steady state. So the derivative of current is zero. I know the speed, I can now find KT. So I'm really finding the back EMF. That gives me KT is 0 0.094, which is pretty close to what the data sheets say. Uh, I'm gonna take the one that I found experimentally. So that's three parameters, uh, resistance, inductance, and torque constant. To find a fourth parameter, there's a couple ways to do that. When I have the motor running like this, I have power coming in. That's volt times amps. Power has to balance. Power in equals power out. So if I have 5 volts times 74 milliamps, I've got 350 milliwatts going in. Those 350 milliwatts have to go somewhere. They go to the motor. That'll be your speed, which I know because I measured it times the friction, plus all the other losses. Uh, assuming these other losses are zero, I can solve for D, and it gives me D is 0 0.01167, Newton meters per rating per second. Uh, turns out what we're gonna see is that's actually a little bit high. The reason being is there are other losses. For example, um, let's go back to here. 
on this guy. This is an inductor. As I apply current, I have energy stored as 1 half Li squared. When the rotor rotates, I switch out one inductor switch to the next. When it switches out, it just takes all the energy in the inductor and dumps it to ground. So I'm losing 1 half Li squared energy every time I switch out a phase. At 32 radians per second, uh, that is five by six, about five rotations per second times six. I'm switching out 30 inductors every second. Uh, 30 inductors times one FLI squared is about one milliwatt of energy I'm losing just from charging and discharging the inductors. That's part of the reason DC motors are less efficient than AC motors. You're switching in and out inductors, the excess energy you dump. Uh, what also happens is that this produces a spark. The energy has to go somewhere, so you're getting the spark. The sparks block um, or jam radio signals. If you listen to an AM radio station as motor spins, you'll hear the little hissing. That's the little sparks from the commutator jamming the radio. Part of the reason the DC motors has have such a heavy casing on them, that's trying to block the radio transmission so you don't get the FCC mad at you. Uh, but that's one of the losses. There's also eddy current losses. I've got currents rapidly changing, which produces eddy current losses in the iron. They've added some banding on here, trying to reduce the eddy current losses, but they're still there. Um, so all those losses combined, I lumped into D, which means the D that I calculated is going to be a little bit high. There is another way to measure D. What I can do is take a step response, and we'll do that in just a sec. Um, but anyway, you can kind of calculate D based upon the measurement. This one will be a little bit high. For the rotor inertia, I can calculate it. I've got right here a flywheel. See, this is the flywheel that I added. Uh, this is actually a bunch of washers I got from Max glued together. The reason that's on there is the motor is just too fast. If I don't put that on there and it doesn't work well for control labs coming up later. Um, but that kind of sim or simulates the car, uh, robot arm, Whatever else you can attach to it has some inertia. I can measure that and calculate the inertia of that disk. And from physics, the mass is the dens or density of iron times the pi r squared times the thickness. It's about 0.255 kilograms, half a pound. The inertia is 1 fm r squared for a solid cylinder. So this one has an inertia of 0 0.00264 kilogram meter cubed. The rotor I lost it. Here it is. The rotor, this guy, if I assume this is a solid iron core that's one centimeter diameter, or one centimeter radius, two centimeter diameter, 40 millimeters long, uh, similar to this one, I calculate its inertia, put the two together, the total inertia is 0 0.0002. Kind of a ballpark guess. You don't actually have to guess or try to estimate the inertia and friction. I can actually find it experimentally. The way you do that is kind of like here. I can take a step response. Here I'm applying plus five volts. Apply minus five, it spins the other way. Plus five, minus five, plus five. Those are step responses. What the step response looks like if I measure the speed versus time is this. When I go from minus five to plus five, or shifting it, going from zero to 10 volts, I'll start from stationary and then go to a different speed. From this, that really looks like a first order differential equation. That's the step response of a first order system. You know, no overshoot, a uh, nice clean response. I can come up with a first order approximation for that. To do that, I would say the DC gain is roughly 6.4. 6 this goes to 64 radians per second. I've got a 10 volt step input. So 64 over 10 is 6.4, your DC gain. The settling time is about 4 sixths of a second. That tells me the dominant pole is right around minus six. So what I can do is say, take a first order approximation that has the same DC gain, same dominant pole, plot the step response of that first order system that's the red line, compared to the actual motor, and you see that the two are pretty darn close. What that means is this motor basically has these dynamics. It's roughly 39 over s plus 6. Well, that lets me find j and d. I've got two parameters, 
39.6 and 6. I've got two unknowns, J and D, so pick J and D to match. Um, these I can't match directly. If I multiply it out, uh, still I can't match it directly. Divide by JR, and now these two are in the same form. I've got constant over S plus constant, constant over S plus constant. These two constants have to match. So KT over JR is 39.28, and DR plus KT squared over JR is 6. Gives you two equations, two unknowns. So solving, KT over JR is 39.28. Uh, tells you, you know, inputting R, L, KT, J is 0 0.0000906, or 90 micro kilogram meter squared. It doesn't seem like a lot, but kind of figure this relative to a meter. The rotor is much less than one meter. Uh, MR squared, squared is much, much less than a meter. That's a pretty reasonable number. And comparing it to the calculations, I've got one, two, three, four zeros, nine. What I calculated somewhere was three zeros, two. Eh, within a factor of three. Okay, this is kind of a crude estimate. This one's probably more accurate. Once you know the inertia, I can find friction. Matching the denominator, 6 is dr plus kt squared over jr. Uh, calculating, d is 0 0.0002 newton meters per rating per second. And if you recall, what we calculated before was d was 0 0.011. This gives you 0 0.002. So again, the first initial estimate was pretty high. This is a better estimate. It matches actual data. So the net result, I now have the five parameters for the motor. I've got the resistance, inductance, torque constant, inertia, and friction. More importantly, I've got a mathematical model to describe the motor. This is the second order system going from voltage to speed. And if you uh, factor it out, I have a dominant pole at minus six and a fast pole. This is the mechanical time constant. That's the electrical time constant, R per L. Oftentimes you ignore the electrical time constant because it's so much faster, you know, the concept of dominant pole, which means if I assume L equals zero, I'm just left with the first order system. So ignoring the dominant, the fast pole, just look at the dominant pole. That's my mathematical model for DC motor. So this guy right here, this motor, I can approximate with that first order system. Uh, significance of this. I wonder what's going on right here. We have a cat that's very interested in the motor. The significance of this is that given the motor, that's the blue line, I can model it mathematically with the red line. Model it as 39.28 over S plus 6. And that's a very good approximation. What that means is that if I can control 39.28 over S plus 6, if I can understand how to, design, how to control this system, I can control the speed of a motor. If I integrate this, integral of speed is position, or integral of angular velocity is angle, if I can understand how to control the second order system, I understand how to control the position of a motor. And a couple of lectures from now, we'll be looking at that. Again, trying to model or design a feedback controllers for this first order system, that's the speed control for motor, or controlling the, the second order system, that's position control. And further, the significance is if you don't have the dynamics of the system stamped on the side, all's not lost. With just a few tests, I can determine the dynamics of a DC servo motor. And really all you care about is this plot right here. That plot right there tells you the step response. If I can come up with a differential equation or transfer function that gives a good close approximation to that blue line, then what works for the model should work for the actual system. They're basically the same. So that's lecture number 17, determining the dynamics of a DC servo motor.